48-hour deadly riot at the Adams County Correctional Facility. The Adams County Correctional Facility became a battleground. Inmates tried to take over. Visible signs of chaos from outside the prison walls. It lasted for 12 hours before officials finally regained control using tear gas and riot gear. We have confirmed one prison guard has been killed. They pull us uh, uh, wet back. This is the Killer Chronicles. On May 20th, 2012, a private federal prison along the Mississippi River became the scene of a takeover riot that brought national media coverage and controversy to a little known facility. Over just seven hours, inmates swarmed the prison grounds, overpowered guards, took hostages, caused $1.3 million in damage, raided the commissary building, and assaulted staff before a prison response team aided by the Mississippi Highway Patrol was able to break through the barricades and recapture the prison. In the end, 20 inmates and staff members were injured, and one guard, 24-year-old Sergeant Catlin Carithers, was beaten to death on the roof of the Chow Hall by at least two men. The riot was short-lived in comparison to other notable prison takeovers, like the two-day 1980 New Mexico State Prison riot that left 33 dead, or the 1987 USP Atlanta riots that spanned 11 days and involved more than 100 hostages. But the notoriety from the Adams County Correctional Center riot of 2012 continues to this day, partially because of the extreme violence and partially because it became a sticking point in the ongoing national debate over America's use of private prisons. We poured through court records, testimony of inmates and guards with first-hand accounts, post-riot audits of the prison, and photos and video footage that tell a story of boiling tension, missed warning signs, and the murder of a guard who answered the call on his day off. To anyone with a trained eye, the day before the riot, May 19th, 2012, provided opportunities to sense the looming danger. One guard, Hunter Floyd, would later recount how he noticed large groups of inmates gathered on recreation yards that morning, huddled together, taking turns talking, and raising their hands in what appeared to be some sort of structured voting. While it was normal for inmates to group together during yard time, this type of semi-formal meeting was highly unusual and raised the question of what they were up to. Later that day, staff got a possible answer when an informant within the inmate population came forward to warn them that trouble was brewing and to expect a protest or some such incident the following morning. He said there was a hit list going around that included the names of guards who would be targeted for violence, and which reportedly included Catlin Carithers. In a lawsuit later filed by the Carithers family, they would claim that the corrections officer who took the report never bothered to inform Carithers about the alleged hit list. After the riot, the informant questioned guards on why they didn't take his warnings more seriously. According to the lawsuit, the higher-ranking officer responded, How do you think I feel? That boy worked for me and I was the one who called him in on Sunday. Before we continue, it seems prudent to give an overview of the Adams County Correctional Center. It is a privately run prison with a capacity of around 2,500, owned by a company that was called the Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, but in November 2016 changed its name to Core Civic Incorporated. Founded in 1983 and based in Nashville, Tennessee, Core Civic has grown into the predominant for-profit corrections and detention company with more than 50% of the United States private prisons under its belt housing a total of 70,000 inmates in federal, state, and local jurisdictions. In 2015, the federal government spent more than half a billion dollars paying Core Civic for its 70 contracted facilities. The ACCC was built in 2009 at a cost of $128 million and designed to house federal prisoners who are scheduled to be deported after serving their sentences. In 2012, the overwhelming majority of prisoners there were Mexican nationals, who made up roughly 2,000 of the approximately 2,600 inmates, and referred to themselves as the Paisas, translated roughly as fellow countrymen. Inmates elected representatives, who were tasked with bringing grievances and concerns to staff and the prison's warden, named Vance Laughlin. 
Hi, I'm Vance Laughlin. I'm the warden at the Adams County Correctional Center. My team and I are... But once the Mexican nationals had become powerful enough within the prison, they used a system that deliberately gave the non-Mexicans less power. They chose representatives from each Mexican state that had a presence in the ACCC, while the remaining 600 or so inmates got to choose a single representative for their entire group. In 2012, that turned out to be a Canadian man named Paul Johnson, who nearly found himself on the injured list that day after speaking out against the plan, and later agreed to testify for the prosecution. As it turned out, in May 2012, there were plenty of grievances to go around. The inmates were increasingly frustrated over what they saw as abysmal medical care and food, with some going so far as to file pro se lawsuits to compel the prison to improve conditions. The inmates blamed staff and the warden, but they also blamed their own representatives for not being assertive with their requests. On May 19, 2012, the Paisas decided to clean house and replace their inmate reps with new elected leaders, one of whom, Juan Bobby Arredondo, allegedly explained their intentions on May 20th thusly. We're going to start breaking and destroying the prison. This is the CCA. They only care about money. On the staff side of things, many felt that Core Civic was ignoring serious safety issues, most notably chronic understaffing that left corrections officers vulnerable in the event of widespread violence. One officer, Deborah Temple, remembers that she and other coworkers voiced this concern to the administration numerous times and knew that the higher-ups were aware of the problem because everyone would be called to work on days they knew the Bureau of Prisons was performing an inspection. My coworkers and I were told to suck it up, Temple later recounted in a sworn court statement. Quote, in fact, I was told to put my big girl panties on and get back to work. The day of Sunday, May 20th, 2012, was no exception. Temple said that there were maybe 20 employees at the facility, and a captain had advised her that she was on a hit list, and there were rumors of a possible demonstration by the inmates. But the warden decided against a lockdown. Around 1.30 that afternoon, Temple was hanging out near her car, taking a 15-minute break and smoking a cigarette, when she heard a commotion on the inside. When she got closer, she realized hundreds of inmates had gathered near a gate adjacent to the prison's chow hall and medical facility, Gate 117. The inmates were loud, rambunctious, and refusing orders to return to their designated housing areas. It hadn't gotten violent yet, but it was a standoff with no end in sight. Estimates of the size of the crowd have differed wildly. The FBI would later claim it was around 200 people. A guard said it appeared much larger, around 1,200 to 1,500, which would be at least half of the prison population, and others said the number was closer to 900. At any rate, the prison staff was badly outnumbered, and the few guards that were there had to mobilize quickly. An assistant chief started handing out duty assignments, while another administrator got on the phone and started calling off-duty guards to come back into work on the double. Among those who responded to the call was Sergeant Catlin Carithers who in turn called his colleague, Corey Lofton, a lieutenant who was leaving Sunday church services when he picked up the phone. He and Catlin headed out to the prison together, thinking they were just attending a peaceful meeting with disgruntled inmates to discuss their concerns. When they arrived, the situation was at a fever pitch, teetering on the brink of a full-on riot. Guards were ordered onto the roofs of the Echo housing unit and the Chow Hall, which overlooked Gate 117, where the crowd remained. Three other guards, Hunter Floyd, Kylie Winchester, and Kenneth White, took refuge in a so-called safe zone, perimeter corridors protected by razor wire fences on either side, where they observed the situation and gave updates via radio. Meanwhile, Sergeant Peggy Stevens and Lieutenant Corey Lofton used a 32-foot ladder brought from a maintenance barn via a tractor to the back of Echo to climb onto that roof. As the guards put on gas masks in anticipation of having to throw gas canisters onto the crowd, the inmates were able to break into the chow hall and retrieve makeshift weapons. From there, it delved into complete chaos. 
Guards were pelted with rocks, full soda bottles, and trash cans. Inmates began rushing the buildings, stacking up food carts on top of each other into makeshift ladders, and chucking gas canisters back onto the roof when guards tried in vain to use them to disperse the crowd. Near the safe zone, a group of inmates were able to break through and climb underneath the razor wire fence, which Lofton said folded like spaghetti against the weight of approximately 30 men. Quote, I saw inmates destroying the facility, tearing gates off hinges, take equipment up and down the walk, looting, you know, arms full of groceries, CO William Higgs later recalled. I saw them holding other officers hostage against their will, threatening their lives. Once inside the safe zone, they overpowered Floyd, Winchester, and White, dragged them down to a far end of the prison and took them hostage for the next several hours. At the same time, this exposed the ladder that Lofton and Stevens had used to climb onto the roof of Echo, and it wasn't too long before the inmates got a hold of that too. Within minutes, they'd gotten onto both roofs, and two pairs of guards found themselves outnumbered, armed with only gas canisters that were proving ineffective against men wielding metal rods, mop handles, and metal food trays. Quote, it was like running of the bulls, Temple later recalled on a witness stand. Lofton said the last thing he remembered was pulling the pin of a gas can and dropping it to his feet, while an inmate swung at him with a makeshift club. The next thing he knew, he was on the ground, being pummeled by multiple people. They handcuffed him to a chain-link fence with his own handcuffs and beat him for what, quote, seemed like forever. They stormed me, started kicking me, hitting me with broomsticks, kicking me in the face, kicking me in the groin, he testified. I had inmates running up beside me saying, Fuck you, Lofton. We finally got your ass. On the roof of the Chow Hall, Temple and Carithers found themselves in a life-or-death situation. Unsure of herself and lacking training to even use gas cans, Temple was following Carithers' lead. But the two were soon separated. Down on the ground, another guard, Robert Scott, later told authorities that Carithers yelled to the inmates, Come after me in an attempt to divert their attention when they began beating Temple. Whether that's true or not, the inmates did beat Carithers, with one man later identified as Hector Pariente Diaz Osuna, using a metal rod to strike him in the head at least four times, and at least one other, Ricardo Gonzalez Porras, joining in on the attack. A few feet away, Temple was knocked unconscious, and when she woke up, Carithers was next to her, face down and barely breathing. Severely injured and barely able to move, she played dead, and a few hours later, braced herself for another beating when she heard voices near her. But it turned out to be a guard who was a part of the emergency response team in the process of taking back the prison. They rushed her, Lofton, and Carithers to a hospital. Lofton remembers watching paramedics do chest compressions on Carithers as they loaded him into a different ambulance. It would be the last time he'd ever see his friend alive. By 9 p.m., the response team, firing beanbags and rubber bullets, officially declared the prison cleared and the riot over. Two hours before the response team had moved in, around 5 p.m., a Jackson TV reporter received calls and text messages from a man who claimed to be an inmate with a cell phone on the inside. They always beat us and hit us. We just pay them back. Tell you the, the, the most the office. Just the management way to disrespect us all the time. Try to get some respect for some officers and lieutenants that owe us uh, uh, wet back. The Mississippi Immigrant Rights Alliance had already heard complaints from prisoners about that private facility in Adams County. We have gotten calls, as uh, you've probably heard, of abuse in that prison and overcrowding. And um, we have called uh, the, the prison to find out what was going on and nobody ever returned phone calls. In an email sent from the same phone, that man who claims to be a prisoner wrote, Yes, we are criminals, but we're human beings. Don't treat us like animals, because you get an animal. Now, I asked Correctional Corporation of America how they handle any claims of abuse from prisoners. They told me they have a toll-free number set up and that they try to get to the bottom of every claim as quickly as possible. Darren and Stephanie. Well, Meg, has this company ever had an officer killed inside of one of their prisons? I actually learned tonight this is the second time CCA has lost an employee to an inmate assault. Okay, amazing story. Thanks so much, Meg. 
In the riot's aftermath, 23 were charged with rioting, but the most serious charges were reserved for three men identified as Carrither's attackers. Diaz Osuna, Gonzalez Porras, and Jesus Beltran Rodriguez, as well as two men identified as the new representatives who'd organized the riot, Ernesto Neto Granados and Juan Bobby Arredondo, who would later deny playing that role. Other inmates testified that they saw Diaz Osuna and Gonzalez Porras attack Carrithers with the makeshift weapons, and though Diaz Osuna's trial ended with a hung jury on the murder count, he eventually pleaded guilty and received 25 years, as did Gonzalez Porras. Beltran Rodriguez got 20 years tacked onto his prison sentence, and Granados and Arredondo each got 10. At his sentencing, Arredondo painted a picture of himself as a bystander who'd been brushed aside when he tried to calm the rioting inmates. Quote, I had nothing and was never in agreement with what happened. I'm against violence, he testified. Adding later, I said to them, calm down, calm down. Nobody listened to me. Diaz Osuna, who was in prison for his role in a scheme to take 30 immigrants hostage in Phoenix and hold them for ransom, allegedly told an FBI agent that Carruthers deserved what he got and that he didn't feel bad, but called off the interview when the agent asked him about his role in the beating. In the aftermath, the Carruthers family filed a lawsuit against Core Civic, arguing the company was responsible for failing to act on warning signs that came 24 hours before the violence started. A judge rejected the suit, writing, quote, Carruthers' death as tragic as it is, was a consequence of conditions brought about by risks of his work environment. The Bureau of Prisons, meanwhile, absolutely reamed Core Civic in post-riot audits, blaming much of what happened on staffing issues that included failing to offer competitive wages to guards, holding guards to lower educational and training standards compared to BOP officers, failing to hire bilingual guards in a prison mostly comprising inmates that spoke only Spanish, and having high turnover rates that led to staffers being in over their heads. To that point, Many of the guards who testified at Diaz Osuna's trial said they'd since moved on to other jobs, and several said that May 20th, 2012 was their last day as a corrections officer. One audit also noted that the prison had only one physician 43% of the time, between December 2012 and September 2015, quote, resulting in inmate-to-provider ratios that were about double those specified in BOP program statements. Core Civic responded in a statement saying, quote, The May 2012 incident at Adams County was a tragedy and an aberration in the company's years long record of safe facility administration, and stated that they'd taken significant steps to improve things at AACCC, including additional training and intelligence gathering. In statements to the media, the company said the only ones responsible for what happened were the inmates. Since 2012, both the ACCC riot and Core Civic have found themselves in the center of the debate surrounding the use of private prisons, and certain activists have used the riot as an example to express their point of view that private prisons are generally less safe and more prone to abuse and exploitation. As it stands now, the use of private prisons seems to have become highly politicized, as evidenced by a federal policy that has seesawed with the last three sitting presidents. In August 2016, then-President Barack Obama announced his Justice Department was ending the use of private federal prisons, a move that was undone just six months later by the Trump administration. During the 2016 presidential campaign, former President Donald Trump said he felt private prisons were generally superior, and by 2019 increased federal spending with private contractors. In January 2021, President Biden announced he was reversing Trump's reversal, with a major irony. His order does not apply to immigration detention centers, including the ACCC. That's it for now. Thank you for listening. If you have any stories that you would like us to cover, tell us about them. Please like and subscribe.